I'm just back from an EPA workshop uh, trying to figure out what the price of carbon is, which did a spectacularly bad job of it. I'll talk a little bit about that here and more in the workshop at 11 o'clock on that subject. But I started with a picture of the Hoover Dam here, uh, not only because I was just there and it's a neat thing to take pictures of, but because it's a reminder that the last time the economy was in this bad shape, the federal government actually built large, valuable things like this, which created thousands of jobs, provided flood control and irrigation benefits throughout the Southwest, and produces a huge amount of zero carbon energy for that region. So we are richer and more powerful today than the generation which was able to do that in response to economic crisis. Yeah, we'll, we'll have a better picture of that in a minute. Uh, so is this, uh, yes, okay, so, uh, particularly coming off of this workshop, I want to talk about uh, one bad and one good argument for pricing carbon. The argument which is sometimes made uh, from economic theory is that if we get the prices right, if, if, we, if we price every externality, every cost that's imposed on society at exactly the right price, it will make the market more efficient, the market will reach optimal outcomes. I think that this is the wrong argument, both because there are all sorts of other things that make markets not uh, work perfectly and not reach optimal outcomes. Lots of other things aren't priced correctly. And because it is staggeringly difficult, uh, in, in fact, in some ways impossible, to come up with a correct price for the damage which is done. The damages are very important, but uh, some of them have prices and some of them don't. So I want to walk quickly through a few of those. Here's one that really does have a price. Uh, air conditioning, right? Those hotter summers that Gary was mentioning. Uh, there's going to be a lot more expenditure on air conditioning, a lot more energy used. Uh, terrible negative feedback. You have more carbon emissions to run air conditioners. Uh, this is, in principle, quite easy to price. Well within the realm of energy economics, well-defined prices for air conditioners and the energy that's used in them. Let's go on to something a little harder there. That's uh, the head of Lake Mead right behind the Hoover Dam and the bathtub rings showing how far below normal levels, that reservoir, the key reservoir for the Southwest uh, is right now. So there is a ongoing water crisis in the Southwest involving scarcity of water, uh, problems for agriculture, problems for energy, and climate change is making a bad situation much worse. This is in principle possible to put a price on, although it's quite complicated. I'm in the midst of a study where we're attempting to come up with some numbers for that. We're still in the realm of things you could price, but that's not even nearly as bad as it gets. Uh, what about endangered species? Uh, big furry ones that people like to take pictures of as well as the other ones that uh, are also ecologically important but less photogenic. Uh, what, what does it mean? Do you want to have people going around doing surveys of how much would you pay to save the polar bears? I mean, people do. Uh, I don't think that that produces a meaningful measure of what the environment, what biodiversity means to us. And there are many more uh, things like that uh, people are going to lose lives to extreme weather events. They are already losing lives. The European heat wave was a dramatic example. The, uh, the Russian heat wave this year. Uh, what are those lives worth? You can't get the right number if you don't have a number for that. You can't actually have an economic expression of the value of it unless you put a number on that. There are economists who have said the scientific thing to do is to use a multiple of per capita income. This has produced outrage on the part of uh, developing country governments who discovered that it was proposed in the IPCC reports, I think in the second assessment, 95, to value American lives at 10 to 15 times the value of other countries' lives. So you can imagine how popular that was with the government of India uh, in this unanimous uh, endorsement process. Um, and so there's, uh, you know, there are many other uh, imponderable questions. Uh, one of the big ones that's coming sometime later this century, somewhere around one to two mil meters of sea level rise makes a whole lot of coastal Asia uninhabitable. The big, the mega cities, the deltas like Bangladesh. And at that point, it's hard to imagine anything other than tens of millions of people becoming climate refugees trying to move to Europe and North America. Uh, uh, you know, Putting a price on that is nonsense, but so is ignoring it. Uh, so that we are really left with a fundamental impossibility of getting the prices right. You can put a lower bound on the dollar value, but you can't actually put a price on the whole thing. So the better reason for pricing carbon is a much more humble, pragmatic one. It's often a good way 
to induce changes in behavior. Uh, not always, but often. This is a pragmatic uh, theoretical, ar not, not an uber theoretical optimal system argument. It's a, you know, this often works to change behavior, but it's important to think about the limits to it. Uh, and it's gotten, I think, an undeservedly good name. Cap and trade was popular with businesses in the case of the sulfur emissions, both because they created a price mechanism and because it gave away a huge new asset, the value of the allowances, which is given to the incumbent businesses that were already polluting. So there's the question of, you know, is it the reliance on prices that they liked or the big giveaway? Turns out with cap and trade without a big giveaway wasn't nearly as popular with them. Uh, <laughs> So I just want to talk about the other things that are needed. Uh, in talking about prices, we need to remember there are things that are done better by regulation. Uh, we need to all buy much more energy efficient appliances. Now, the, the picture here, one of these dreadful little labels, you know, you go and buy an appliance, there are these labels on them. You can get people to buy more if energy efficient appliances using price mechanisms. It means you have to take a calculator along and figure out what's the life cycle energy that's used and how does that compare to the difference in price between these two appliances. Nobody wants to do that, right? I have a PhD in economics. I like numbers. I don't want to do that. <laughs> Nobody is going to do that. It's actually better. It's a better way to live, to have regulations as we do, which say that only fairly efficient appliances can be sold. Your life is better with fewer choices in this case. So question to ponder. Uh, there's also a role for public spending. Price incentives didn't put a man on the moon. Price incentives didn't create the microelectronics industry that was created by the Pentagon, uh, huge investments in the 50s and 60s. Uh, price incentives didn't create wind power. That's also been created by government spending. Uh, research into new low carbon technologies has to be a function of government. Uh, but as Gary said, it's necessary but not sufficient. There are people who have going around claiming that that's the only thing that we need, and this cartoon is for them. Uh, that this is, uh, the, you know, the picture of, uh, you know, sitting and looking, you know, 50 years later. Uh, what is it that we're going to invent, invent that will solve the problem? Hopefully a time machine that will take us back so we can do it right the first time. Uh, it's, uh, so I, I want to switch to talking about the role of economics in the arguments for inaction. The, the, the old arguments I think we're familiar with, it's not to say that we've won them, uh, is the science wrong? No, it's been subject to very well-funded hostile vetting and there's nothing more than a few typographical errors in it. Uh, is it too uncertain to act on? No, it, uncertainty is not the same as ignorance. We know that things are getting worse. We, there are interesting scientific reasons why we don't know exactly how fast is it getting, how bad. But the new argument to beat is the argument that uh, yes, it's happening, but it's too expensive to do something about it. And with the subsidiary question that are some economists, or even, even more some voices outside economics, which are making this argument, the, the new intellectual enablers of inaction. Uh, what this leads to, uh, I have a brief uh, postmodern moment here of deconstructing the phrase, it's too expensive. Uh, it turns out that it's too expensive actually implies it's optional. Uh, right, it's correctly used in the sentence, I'd like to go on vacation in France, but it's too expensive. Right, uh, this is something that's optional. The status quo, life, you know, tragically devoid of foreign vacations is actually a viable alternative. Right, it, it's incorrectly used in this sentence, you know, we're under attack from terrorists, but it's too expensive to do anything about it. Right, uh, that uh, nobody thinks the status quo of not doing anything about it is acceptable. Having just recently been on a plane, I could definitely tell you how it's possible to do it wrong, but uh, it's, uh, that's not to say that doing it in some form is optional. Right? And so the question is, right, which is climate policy more like an optional vacation or defending ourselves against a threat to our way of life? You all know the answer to that. Um, so, um, you know, who is it that's arguing this? Uh, Bjorn Lomborg, who was an obscure Danish political scientist before he discovered he could become famous attacking environmentalists. Uh, his, as this book, Cool It, uh, in which he claims, and you know, as he's been increasingly claiming, well, climate change is real, but, right? But what? But it's, uh, tr it, according to him, trivial damages. 
uh, really, to, you know, just little things around the edge, sort of second, third order problem, and huge costs, right? So we'd be better off spending our money on something that's really worth doing, like uh, preventing malaria. So proving that climate policy is way too expensive, relying on a small number of economists, particularly Richard Toll, who I think is emerging as, you know, Lomborg's favorite economist, the, the, man who, uh, the man who demonstrates scientifically that it's too expensive to do anything about it. Uh, this leads to this sort of thing. This was always my favorite summary of the, the Bush administration's climate policy, which may be coming back with the new elections. Uh, you know, what, you know, suppose, uh, suppose your firehouse ran the way that we've run these debates in Congress about uh, global warming. Uh, make sure everyone agrees there's a fire, bring in a few outside skeptics, <laughs> consider that it could be a small fire, uh, realize that calling the fire department is free, and so on. I mean, if this seems too partisan, you can wait for the next version. But um, this, I mean, this is, this is where the, the economics of it's too expensive gets you. Uh, a real climate economics is the opposite. Uh, that uh, you know, the response is you know the, the costs of reduction are modest, the damages are large. I have critiques of Lombard's economics and risk and climatic change. You can look up. Uh, this I think is unfortunately where the Obama administration ends up. Rather than embracing the alternative, uh, we decided the truth must be somewhere in the middle. Um, okay, I've done studies of the costs of inaction. Uh, as we're running short on time, I won't go into them a lot. The cost of inaction in Florida, we did a study three years ago for EDF, not attempting to put a price on everything, but a price on four particular categories of climate damages gets up to 5% of state GDP by 2100. We did a similar study for the US. I mean, Florida is one of the most exposed areas, so we got a bigger number there. Similarly, four categories of uh, the cost of inaction for the US got up to 1.8% of GDP for the US by uh, 2100, and uh, the U.S. is a colder, richer country than most, so the damages will be greater in most places. Uh, the Stern Review, done for the British government, uh, estimated, depending on how you measured it, 5 to 20 percent of the damages, uh, 5 to 20 percent of world output lost to damages, which could be largely presented, prevented by spending 1 percent of, um, of world output. Uh, dismissed as one radical report uh, by Lomborg or as not peer-reviewed economics by Toll. Uh, if we're going to talk about the price of carbon, I wanted to end up with uh, saying, well, what do people think it is? Because is it one thing to say you should put a price on carbon, how vigorous a policy that represents has a lot to do with how high the price is. So the price per ton of CO2, uh, Richard Toll in the fund model says two to nine dollars. Uh, a dollar per ton of CO2, if you passed it on at the gas pump, is a penny per gallon, right? So think of that as, that's two to nine cents per gallon. Uh, the US government, this uh, dreadful process about the social cost of carbon, uh, came up with $21, or if you said tolls model shouldn't be included in the mix, took it out, you'd get $29. Uh, the, the numbers highlighted in yellow here, I think, are an interesting cluster uh, around $75 to $100. Uh, the $75, we did a study in my research group of what does it cost to reach this relatively mild target of 17% reduction in U.S. emissions by 2020. We came up with $75. Uh, the Stern Review came up with $85 a few years ago. Uh, the British, the, the German EPA equivalent had uh, come up with $100. The newest version of the PAGE model, one of the models used in this uh, U.S. government process, also says $100. I, since with this is just pragmatic to get people to change their behaviors, it's not really based on an optimal uh, economic model. Suppose you wanted to have people drive in this country drive cars as small and sensible as they drive in Europe and use public transportation as much as they do in Europe. Uh, the price of carbon that it would take to bump our gasoline prices up to Western European ones would be 300. Um, and the most interesting theoretical work in economics that's been done in this climate change area, Martin Weitzman's uh, dismal theorem, says that we are so uncertain about it that in a certain technical sense, uh, the price could be thought of as being infinite, There's sort of no price too high. Uh, that if you average across many, many different climate scenarios, as you go out to the tail of the distribution, that the damages get worse faster than they get impossible, improbable, so the product of you know, worsening damages times probability, uh, the, the intrinsic uh, impossibility of knowing whether we can avoid the worst case scenarios of the fat tail argument that 
you may have heard about, leads to saying, you know, it could be as large as you want it to be. So I think there are good reasons to price carbon. What the price is matters a lot, $21 a ton. The current official position of the U.S. government is a ridiculously low number, uh, which I'll talk about in the 11 o'clock workshop about more exactly how they got that and why it's the wrong answer. And um, that's it. If you like the movie, you'll love the book.